my AP Chemistry, I'm going to try and shoot this thing really quickly. This is on Hess's Law, which again, you had first year chemistry. Uh, this is actually section three, and it is um, another way of calculating enthalpy change. Please remember enthalpy change is a heat transfer at constant pressure. Hess's Law will prove that enthalpy is a state function. A state function does not depend on pathway. A state function is something you can measure and get the same answer every time. So Hess's Law will prove this. We are going to do some examples on Hess's Law, and the overall enthalpy change of the reaction will equal the same thing no matter how many steps you will have, which is pretty much what the slide says. You can calculate enthalpy if it is achieved through a one-step system, a two, a three, a four, or whatever. So the same enthalpy values no, no matter how many steps there are. A couple of things to remember. Exothermic process is a process that gives off heat, transfers thermal energy from the system to the surroundings. This is an example of an exothermic process. This is also the second favored way of writing a thermochemical equation. Exothermic heat is produced or released. It's written in the body of the reaction. Please remember the most popular way of writing thermochemical equations. is this way. There are two ways to write thermochemical equations. What you're looking at here is the second most popular way. So bottom line, if it's an exothermic process, energy will be produced. Energy will be lost from the system to the surroundings. Energy can be transferred in physical changes also. Gaseous water moving really fast, high energy becomes liquid water, moving a lot slower, less energy. Where does the difference in energy go? You're going from a high energy system to a low energy system. All that excess energy released. So it is also an exothermic process. Endothermic process, any process in which heat has to be supplied to the system from the surroundings. Most of your chemical reactions are going to be exothermic. Uh, if it's an endothermic process, an endothermic chemical or physical reaction, the energy is placed on the reactant side. That means that the reactants need more energy to break bonds. And a solid to a liquid, ice to water. Why does ice melt? Ice melts because it's absorbing energy from the surroundings. Enthalpy is used to quantify the heat flow into or out of a system in a process that occurs at constant pressure. Again, from the previous video, we found that enthalpy change is heat transferred at a constant pressure. H is the symbol for enthalpy. We cannot directly measure the enthalpy of a process, so we measure the change in enthalpy. And the change in enthalpy will be the enthalpy of the products minus the enthalpy of the reactants. It's the heat given off or absorbed during a reaction, whether it be physical or chemical, at constant pressure. Picture on the left, the energy or enthalpy of the products is less than the reactants. Products minus reactants will give you a negative value. The negative sign tells you direction, so it's going to be exothermic. Picture on the right, the energy of the products is greater than the reactants. Products minus the reactants will give you a positive value. That's going to be endothermic. The sign tells you direction. Hess's Law. Hess's Law, the change in enthalpy, or delta H, will be the same whether your reaction takes place in one step, two step, 
three steps, four, five, six, doesn't matter. You sum up the steps, you get the exact same answer. Enthalpy is a state function. Hess's law proves enthalpy is a state function. Does not depend on pathway. For example, the synthesis of nitrogen dioxide in one step has an enthalpy change of 68 kilojoules. That is 68 kilojoules is absorbed by the reactants in order to break those bonds and to be rearranged. So in other words, the breaking of the reactant bonds requires more energy than the making of the product bonds. And that energy must come from an outside source, electricity, fire, an ignition of some sort. The same reaction, but cut into two steps. So again, same reaction, the synthesis of nitrogen dioxide, but this time it's placed in two steps. Step one, they make the nitrous monoxide first, and then step two, they make the nitrogen dioxide. Notice a couple of things. If you sum up the enthalpy change of the steps, you get the exact same answer. It is exactly the same, proving that enthalpy is a state function. And if I broke this uh, same reaction up into three steps, I'd still get 68 kilojoules. Something else I want you to write down. Notice that the nitrogen monoxide, this guy here, he gets produced in step one. and used up in step two. This is called an intermediate. So nitrogen monoxide is an intermediate. Notice from the overall reaction here in the one step, or the sum of the two, nitrogen monoxide does not appear. It is an intermediate. All right, how does Hess's law work? And I am going to do an example. We are going to calculate the heat of formation for the synthesis of carbon disulfide. Now, don't panic. This guy here refers to standard states. Meaning what state of matter is it at room temperature and it's in its liquid form. Rxn stands for reaction. So we are going to calculate the enthalpy change of this chemical reaction of this synthesis of carbon disulfide. I refer to this guy as my target. This is my target reaction. I cannot manipulate him in any way, shape, or form. So I refer to him as my target. And then I have steps given to me in the problem. So pause the video. These are the steps. The steps are given in the problem, just like the target is. And you're basically doing an enormous puzzle. If you manipulate the steps correctly, you will be able to sum up the enthalpy of each step and get the enthalpy of the target reaction. So a couple of things to know. Thing number one, you can only mess with the steps. Never mess with the target reaction. Thing number two, if you multiply the reaction through by some number, whether it be 2 or 1 half or 6 or whatever, then you have to do the same thing to the enthalpy. If you reverse the step, you have to change the sign of the enthalpy of the step. If you reverse a step and multiply it through by some number, 
you have to do the same thing to the enthalpy of the step. So I am going to do an example here. I'm going to do this example. I'm going to tackle it one step at a time. I don't have to go in order of step one, step two, step three. All right, so here's my target reaction. So what I want to do, here's my goal, if I can manipulate the steps to look like that after I add them all up, I can comfortably add the enthalpy of the steps and say that it is the enthalpy of my target reaction. So this is my target reaction. Step one was given. All right, so what I do is I kind of eyeball my step and I ask myself two questions. Question number one, in the step I have carbon on the left hand side of the arrow. Is the carbon in the step on the exact same side of the arrow as my target reaction? And the answer is yes. Question number two, does this carbon have the exact same coefficient as the target? And the answer is yes. Now notice I focused on carbon. Why? Because there is no O2 or CO2 in my target. So they must cancel out. They must be intermediates and they will cancel out somewhere along the line. So I'm going to write myself a little note and say no change. I am not going to do anything. I am not going to reverse. I am not going to multiply through. I am going to leave it alone. All right, step number two. Okay, so now I'm going to compare step number two to my target reaction, and my eyeball goes to the sulfur. Why? Because again, O2 and SO2 do not appear in my target reaction. It must mean they're going to cancel out somewhere along the line. So I'm going to focus my attention for this step on the sulfur. And I'm going to ask myself the exact same questions. Question number one, is this sulfur on the exact same side on the step as it is in the target? And the answer is yes. Okay, so I don't have to reverse it. Don't reverse. And again, notice I'm only messing with the steps, not the target. Leave the target alone. Second question. Is the coefficient for the sulfur exactly the same in the step as it is in my target? And the answer is no. That means I have to multiply the entire reaction by 2. So I'm going to cross this out neatly. And I'm going to get rid of this guy. And I'm going to rewrite the second step multiplied through by 2. And when I multiply through by 2 for the reaction, I do it for the enthalpy also. All right, on to the third step, step number 3. All right, now I'm going to ask myself the same questions, the same two questions for step number three as I did for the first two steps. Question number one, is the carbon disulfide on the exact same side of the arrow in the step as it is on the target? And the answer is no. So I'm going to have to reverse this reaction. And if I reverse a reaction, I write it from right to left. I just flip it and change the sign of my enthalpy. Second question, does the carbon sulfide have the exact same coefficient as in the step? Second question, does the carbon disulfide have the exact same coefficient in the step as it does in the target reaction? And the answer is yes, so I don't have to multiply it by anything. Now keep in mind multiplying it by a number could include one half if you have to get rid of a coefficient. 
So I am going to reverse this reaction. I'm going to put a nice, neat little line through it so I can rewrite it. Since I reversed the reaction, I changed the sign of the enthalpy. And if you think about it, it makes a little sense. If the reaction between carbon disulfide and oxygen is exothermic, then the reaction between carbon dioxide and sulfur dioxide must be endothermic. So it makes sense. All right, so what I do next is, since I've manipulated all three steps, did not touch my target. Target is never touched. It's just com there for comparison. If I add up my steps appropriately, and what I do is I put a line so everything on the left stays on the left and everything on the right stays on the right. If I add up my steps and it looks exactly like my target, then I can comfortably add up my enthalpy changes of the steps and assume it is the enthalpy change of the target. So I'm going to add everything up from step one. I have a carbon and an oxygen gas on the left. From step two, I have two sulfurs and two oxygen gases. And step three, I have two sulfur dioxides and a carbon dioxide. You have to be very careful because you're writing this stuff again and again and again, and it could get pretty dodgy. Now, what I want you to realize something is, I know that the carbon dioxide is going to cancel out. Why? It is not in the target. I know the sulfur dioxide is going to cancel out. Why? It is not in the target. Oxygen, it's got to cancel out, and I've been saying that. And why? Because it's not in the target reaction. All right, let's see. And they have three oxygen gases and carbon disulfide. So I'm going to do a little cleanup here. Two plus one is three, minus three cancels. The carbon dioxide minus a carbon dioxide cancels. Two sulfur dioxides and two sulfur dioxides cancel. Notice carbon in that graphite form, which I plugged back in from the original reaction. Sulfur, I think they called this guy rhombic, which is just the funny structure, producing one carbon disulfide Notice, exactly like my target, then my enthalpy change is going to be the sum of him, him, and him. A positive 1072 plus a negative 592.2 plus a negative 393.5 going to give me 86 kilojoules. Right? So here's basically what this means. In order to break these bonds, I need an extra 86 kilojoules from an outside source. Because remember, if it's an endothermic reaction, that means that the heat or the energy of the products is greater than the energy of the reactants. That means the reactants are going to have to get an outside source for this reaction to occur. It's an endothermic reaction. You need a little outside energy for this to happen. Step one, two, and three, again, given the following data, these are the steps, one, two, and three. And here's my target reaction. All right, so I'm going to rewrite this. Here's my target. And my target is 2N2 and 5 oxygens and 2 N2O5s. And we are finding the enthalpy change of this particular reaction. So step one, they give me. Truthfully, to be honest with you, I'm not quite sure what to do with step number one. So I'm going to leave it alone for right now. And I'm going to jump to step number two. Uh, I'm assuming that I will figure out what to do for step number one after the other steps. 
so you don't have to do them in order. I'm not quite sure, because none of these appear other than the oxygen, but I don't know what to do with it. So I'm going to leave it alone for the moment and jump to the other step and figure out that. And So what I'm going to do for step two is I'm going to ask myself the same questions. I'm going to focus on N205. And my question is, first question is, is the N205 in the step on the same side of the arrow as in the target reaction? And my answer is no. So I'm going to reverse this guy. Second question, does the N205 in the step have the same coefficient as the target reaction, and the answer is no, so I'm also going to multiply through by 2. So here's what I get. I reverse and multiply through, and I'm going to draw a small little line neatly. So I've got 4 HNO3, 2 N205, and 2 waters. Since I reversed the step and doubled it, my energy okay, step number three is given as and again really kind of a big puzzle and I really hate fractions, but somewhere along the line, I think step number three is going to help me figure out what I have to do to step number one. Because remember, I left step number one alone because I really wasn't sure. All right, so I'm going to look at step number three. And what catches my eye, and the only thing that catches my eye is the nitrogen. All right, so I'm going to focus on that. So first off, it's... I'm going to ask myself the exact same questions. Is it on the correct side in the step as it is in the target? So yes. So I'm not going to reverse. Next question is, does it have the exact same coefficient in the step as it does in the target? And the answer to that one is no, definitely not. Well, I want the step to have the exact same coefficient, so I'm going to have to multiply the entire reaction by 4. So I'm going to put a small little line through it, because I've got to rewrite it. Which, okay, notice, again, it's kind of a puzzle. I get this. They're going to end up canceling because they're on opposite sides of the arrow. So I'm doing something right. And my enthalpy, which is going to be multiplied by 4, I have to deal with step number 1. And, and if you notice, figuring out this guy has helped me with step number 1. All right, so this guy has helped me figure out what to do with step number 1. Step number one, I'm not actually comparing to the target. I'm actually comparing it to step number three. I want to definitely reverse, because I'm going to need to cancel the hydrogens and the oxygens. So definitely reverse this reaction. And based on step three, I'm going to have to multiply it by two. So I'm going to reverse it. That gives me a positive times 2. So I took this and did the exact same thing to it. All right, so I'm obviously on the right track because I'm starting to see where this is going to happen correctly. And again, I didn't compare it to the target reaction. I actually compared it to step 3 because, again, intermediates, they get... Produced in one step, used up in another. Intermediates don't appear in the target reaction. So boy, this is kind of sloppy. But what I want to do is I want to add up everything on the left here. I want to tidy it up and add up everything on the left here. And i got to be really careful because, man, 
this is a messy job. So I see two waters, four HNO3s, and again as I'm doing this, I'm thinking, okay, is this going to cancel? And I'm hoping that I can eyeball and see that I'm doing okay. Everything on the right, okay, I'm so far so good because I see my hydrogens. All right, six minus one, I think I'm doing okay. Okay, I'm definitely running out of room. Let's see. This cancels because four minus four is zero. And since it doesn't appear in the target, it should. Boy, I hope my waters cancel, and they do. Two waters minus two waters. They don't appear in the target, so they should. He's not going to cancel. He's okay. I have oxygens in the target, but there are only five. But I have a six minus a one. So six minus one is going to leave me five. So that's good, because that matches the target. And the hydrogens cancel. So what I have left over after the cleanup and throwing back in my states of matter, hopefully they gave me states of matter. Yeah, they did. Throwing back in my states of matter, so my finished product here will hopefully look exactly like the target. And you will notice that this is my finished product. And it is exactly like the target. So I am going to add up, and I've got to find them because what a messy job here. Uh, this guy, this guy, and this guy. Add them up, and my enthalpy for this synthesis of dinitrogen pentoxide is just the sum of the steps. And I will get a positive 28 point four kilojoules and again it's an endothermic reaction so again there has to be an extra external energy applied to the reactants so that their bonds will break and that's Hess's law